Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta. Is democracy failing in India? Is democracy being killed, perhaps slaughtered systematically? To look at the current state of democracy, electoral democracy, which some describe is actually an electoral autocracy, I have with me here in the studio of Newsclick the co-author of this book. This is the book. It's provocatively titled to, to Kill a Democracy and it's subtitled India's Passage to Despotism. With me here, I have very happy to have Devashish Roy Chaudhary, fellow Bong from Kolkata. He's the lead author. With him is Professor John Keane of the University of Sydney and the WSB in Berlin. And together they have written this book. And for the information of our viewers, Devashish is born and brought up in Kolkata, studied at South Point School, Scottish church, college at the university, studied economics, worked in Kolkata-based publications like The Telegraph, Telegram. Statesman, Hindustan Times, and is currently based in Hong Kong. But before that, he's worked all over. He's worked in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Hua Hin, Bangkok, Beijing. Thank you so much, Debashish. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Paranjal. Before I ask you a few questions about what to summarize some of the main points in your book, I want to know from you, why did Oxford University Press not publish the India edition of this book? And what happened thereafter? Well, um, so what happened was that we uh, did this book deal with the um, headquarters in um, Oxford uh, in London. and. Um, and the understanding was that after the book was globally launched, it was to be printed in India in a, a low-cost edition a week after the global launch. So the book launched globally in, I think, last July, last year. And just a week that after... That is July 2021. 2021. And, and just a week after that, it was supposed to launch uh, here. Um, but suddenly we came to know, we were informed, that the book was going a fresh set of reviews, in-house review for India. And, and we were very confused because an academic book already has gone through what we would um, think is a, has been a rigorous review process. Academic, scholarly, no, or also was, journalistic? Yeah, so, so it already went through that rigorous uh, um, review process and, and we didn't know why they were doing this all over again for India. And when we asked them, they said, well, this is a standard thing. We have to do this. So we said, OK, fine, we'll wait. But then months went by, and we didn't hear anything from them. And we were getting impatient because it was stupid. The book was written for Indians, for India. And uh, I could buy the book in Hong Kong. I could, you could buy the book in Estonia. My co-author can buy the book in Sydney. But oh, the book was not on the market in India. And so, and we kept asking them and they kept saying that we are reviewing, we are reviewing. So we didn't know what was going on. And around that time, I think, um, when people started asking us, when we were giving talks on the book, there was this talk at Manthan that we did over Zoom. Which uh, is an organization in Hyderabad. Hyderabad. Hyderabad, yes. So well, they invited us to give a talk on the book. And there, uh, well, some people asked us about the book, why is it not in India yet? And then uh, I think journalists started looking into it. And when journalists started talking to OUP, it was then that OUP told The Telegraph, which happens to be my first newspaper, it told The Telegraph that they found the content provocative. The, who was it? Was was a person named? I, I don't, you don't know who? I don't know so who. So it was possibly somebody who spoke off the record, somebody, some obviously uh, some somebody yes. high up yeah. in the Oxford University yeah. Press in India. Yeah. Oh, so this is what they told uh, a journalist the in the Telegraph. Oh, they never told us this. So, and it was clearly evident that there was a problem. 
so we and i don't want to uh, make wild guesses here because our editors our or the entire uh, headquarters at oup has been tremendously supportive of the book throughout it was only when it came to india that we started facing this problem and so we were very confused and are you I, still confused uh, well uh, let's not uh, <laughs> go there because they have been very helpful throughout and so we um, asked them see uh, we told them that we see that you have a problem so why don't we take the problem off your hand give us the south asia rights back and we will find somebody else to uh, print the book because the whole idea was that you would print the book here and sell it cheap not import the book here and sell it for 1700 rupees i won't buy a book for yes, 1700 yeah, rupees yeah this book is priced at 600 rupees yeah. 599 yeah, yeah which is yeah. by indian standards you exactly. would say the re- a reasonable price reasonable for a book price yeah but the import price or the one that they were selling it at the hard cover was like 1600 or 1700 three times yeah so almost three times insane okay and uh, so that was when we took back the rights and we uh, talked to different publishers here uh and that's been very you, kind and, and that's when you went to pan macmillan in india yes also we gave the rights to pan macmillan who very kind when was it published uh, in india so finally it came out they moved very quickly and oup also uh, the headquarters uh, also helped to move files very quickly to them so we were in the market i think by the um, by january i think we were on the market so so you lost about about half a year about yes 5 6 months more than that we lost uh, the synergy because when you are launching a book globally and and this book if you flip through it you will see the it got tremendously uh, no it's got good ex- reviews. excellent re- reviews a- excellent reviews in all the foreign journals uh, milan vaishnav says at once quick paced and sober the book addresses a key puzzle about modern politics why do poor citizens in a poor democracy continue to be left behind it's just one of the endorsements yeah, you got so if you look here i mean uh, yes. there were so many endorsements that we had to put it here correct excellent <laughs> very, very well and times literally supplement asia times financial times los angeles review of books etc etc we we'll, let's come to that a little later oh, so we lost that synergy all right let me ask you a different question let me speculate would i be correct in presuming that either there was some pressure on the high ups of oxford university press in india not to publish your book and distribute it or do you think this was a classic case of what you might describe as self censorship that somebody in the oup in india decided quote and quote that your book was too provocative and they didn't want to get into trouble with the indian authorities see uh, i don't i don't want to uh, make guesses here because uh, as i said oup has been very helpful despite all the problems that we went through but one thing i will mention here is that around the time of the launch what happened was i wrote a piece for time magazine in which i blamed uh, the modi government for screwing up the vaccine policy and uh, that didn't go down very well and uh, the organizer this was in late 2021 no this was uh right around the time the book was globally launched okay so it it was a in- month before i think I the see. book was globally launched and and all my um, author bio in time magazine carried in so and so is the co-author of the forthcoming uh, or to kill a democracy and soon after the organizer which is the mouthpiece of the rss they did a nasty piece on me in general and and the nasty went, piece in what sense they they said know, like i am part of the like i am this part of the anti modi brigade out to defame india and and, and you are an indian standard, but who writes for western publications and you are very caught up with the western yeah, view of the of western india. view and not just that i think because i live in hong kong it gets more complicated than that because i live in hong kong i am automatically chinese agent somehow <laughs> and and of course as a bengali i must be a communist So Though the communists, I mean, they're I mean, in West Bengal, they don't have a single seat yeah, in the but, assembly. Yeah, you know, but 
if you are a Bengali, you must be a communist. So See. I get you somehow, were stereotyped. Yeah. So I get somehow I get paid by the West. Somehow I also get paid by China. Sometimes I get paid by China to write for Western publications. I really don't know how that works, but you must be rolling. In I wealth. am rolling. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, you would have become <laughs> what Jack Ma I by should, now. Yeah, I should buy an island in Greece or something. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Let's get down to some serious talking. Your book is clearly extremely alarmist about the state of the democratic health of this country. Now, so what's new about what you've written? I mean, Mr. Modi, our Prime Minister on the 15th of August, from the ramparts of the Red Fort, describes India as the mother of democracy. In the past years, the US has often been called the world's oldest democracy, and sometimes we are, of course, supposed to be the world's largest democracy in terms of sheer numbers because the number of people who live in India is more or less equal. We might have already overtaken the People's Republic of China, but now there are several definitions of what is democracy and what is not democracy. I'd like to know from you in brief, why do you argue that India has moved towards despotism and democracy is being killed by the present regime. Okay, first or the main point of this book is to make it clear that this, um, that this thing that we are hearing now about Modi killing democracy is slightly misleading because the point that we make just as you said that there is nothing new here, right? Uh, democracy has been facing difficulties in India for a long time. So this is a point that we also try to capture in the book that there is a continuum in the process of killing democracy. It's, it has not just happened in the last eight years. These pathologies that have been very evident even when I was growing up, I, I grew up under the communists and you know how it was in Bengal and before that the Congress and after the communist uh, uh, Freedom World Congress. TMC. TMC, I think, when I was thinking about the book, um, TMC, there was this uh, panchayat election, I forget the year, where I think um, oh, they won 25% of the 60,000 seats uncontested because they would because not there were no, let anybody there was, else contest. There was nobody yeah. contesting those no. seats. You couldn't even go to the um, office and register your name Candidature. as a contestant. Yeah. So, um, so what we have tried to capture is the continuum of this degradation of democracy. So, so uh, we make this point very clear that this is not entirely a new phenomenon, but this is often overlooked uh, by, especially by international observers. One problem is that people, when they talk about Indian politics, or they concentrate on the center, the, the federal politics. People have not paid attention to what has been going on in the states. But the fact is that at the state level, uh, institutions, institution capture, um, uh, violent elections, they have been pretty common at the state level. But, but we have somehow never factored that. You used to call, so, them, call, the, call it booth capturing. Booth capturing uh, once upon a time. Scientific before, rigging. Before, uh, uh, before Mandel Commission was introduced, there were often uh, cases where, you know, like, uh, because the upper caste, they control the public uh, good, often the... Um, they were private militia. They were private militia. Often the schools, as like simple things, like the school, schools in villages are often located in upper caste areas. All right. And where the lower caste couldn't, uh, go to vote. So like there has been a systematic um, exclusion, okay. violence, let, let me lot of that. Let me stick to the so-called Western perception of democracy in India and ask you your opinion. You know, uh, in March 2022, a Sweden-based organization called VDEM, Varieties of Democracy Institute, and they have an index called the Liberal Democracy Index. And India was clubbed among the top 10 autocratizing nations 
And it says there's a democratic slide which is continuing. Yes. And put India in the category of Brazil and Turkey and Hungary. And this same organization in 2021 had classified India as an electoral autocracy. autocracy. And it also argues that much of this slide has been after 2014, when Narendra Modi became the Prime Minister of India. What are your views? Absolutely. So, so what we have also tried to do in the book is to show that these, or this slide has been um, happening over the decades, but these pathologies have intensified considerably in the last eight years. In what ever way? Since. So, uh, the civil liberties, for example, or the, or the way civil liberties are being curbed uh, is is quite unprecedented. I mean, you could you would see this in states before, but you would not see this at the federal level, at at um, or with this intensity before. But um, in your book, you talk about money power in politics. You talk about I'm, I'm coming to that criminalization. But yes, but, but I'm I, I, I'm going to ask you what is new. No, 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 no. But before I come there, uh, there's one point that we have to make. Despite this continuum of uh, degradation, there is one thing which is very unique to this last eight years is the brutalization of your 14-15% of the population or to mobilize the majority. You're talking about the Muslims? Yes. One out of seven Indians? Yeah. Also, also this is a relatively new phenomenon and, and this pointed brutalization of Muslims uh, to mobilize uh, Hindu vote this adds a completely different layer to your democratic decline. I mean, um, Muslims have, of course, uh, historically been excluded. We know that, which is why the Sachar Commission had to be appointed. We know that. But here, uh, to uh, pointedly, deliberately um, humiliate uh, Muslims brutalize their lives. You talk about the National Register of Citizens, the, you talk about the Citizenship Amendment Act, and you see that Islamophobia is been on the rise in the last eight years, and would you compare it with what happened in the past, in the, in the 40s? Uh, in the 40s, I think it's not fair to compare uh, today's India with the 40s because it was uh, the Muslim composition then in, in parts of India. Like Muslims are clearly a minority in India now. In, in many parts of India in the 40s they were not. So I, I don't think I would go there but the thing is that uh, the uh, blatant uh, hate crime, the blatant hate speech from the very highest levels of uh, our polity that we have seen in the last Mob eight lynching. years, lynching and and the um, backing of the state of these um, vigilante groups, um, this oh, this adds, a, as I said, a completely new layer to this entire concept of this idea of uh, democratic decline because elections, by their very nature. Uh, protects the interests of the majority, right? Especially the kind of electoral system that we have. We have. Which is borrowed from the Westminster yeah. style, first past the post, right. winner takes all. Uh, so we have specific institutions uh, to protect the minorities because uh, democracy at the end of the day is judged not by how it treats its majority who are in any case protected by elections or their interest but how it treats its minorities and and in that test india has been failing miserably in the last um, 8 years and and this failure is a deliberate failure they want to fail because this failure gets them votes so this is a completely new aspect but now if you go back to the continuum that we were talking about, uh, violence, uh, dark money in politics. These are, yes, you're right, we have, we have had these same problems before, but again, these have increased many fold, not in just the last eight years, mind you. It has happened over a period yes. of time. And you would say the same thing about the use of money power 
The yes, new dimension absolutely. is electoral bonds, you can say. Absolutely. Or the use of muscle power. Absolutely. This has, if you just look at <coughs> the number of, of Kroropathis, MPs, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, you will see how those numbers have increased. If you look at the number of uh, MPs with criminal backgrounds, and um, over the last, say, five elections, you will see how they have increased over the years. Okay, my last question to you. Though your book, it could be argued, is very, very bleak, almost throughout, yet you end on an optimistic note. After arguing why we've had so many problems, I mean, just the section, social emergencies, democide towards despotism, you still conclude on an optimistic note. When the going gets tough, democracy fosters hope against hope. It stirs up insurrections. It gives energy to the sense it's possible to change things. You go on, no famine and slavery. Clean running water, better schooling, decent health care. This is exactly what the government wants. I mean, it is no different. Every regime has wanted it greater social equality. You see, in moments when democracy falls sick, this is perhaps its most import, important virtue. It inspires citizens to take full advantage of what they have and what comes their way to build a better future, not just for the rich and the powerful few. The next general elections in India, year and a half away, the conclusion of your book is, all, is very, very different. I would say that the tone and the tenor of the bulk of what you've written with John Cain. So these, this is my last question to you, and you can summarize your thoughts. Well, uh, I think what, I mean, there are various sources of hope for me. Um, some of these are, one is that we are, we have a democratic instinct, at least when it comes to politics. I think Indians have a democratic instinct, and it has been honed for seven decades. Um, our uh, uh, vibrant politics, uh, endless social movements, uh, all of these like uh, judicial activism, uh, or these instruments like PIL, which allows people to or take um, you're talking uh, about public interest litigation. Yes, yes, public interest litigations which allow activists. So there is activism. Also, there is an um, there has been a sharpening of our democratic instincts. Uh, we are remember we are the products of the freedom movement. So protest is deeply ingrained in our DNA, and and any regime which thinks that it can. Cow say, down say the, the farm, farmers' agitation. The, yes, the farmers' agitation. Even the CAA, uh, the anti-CAA, NRC agitation, which uh, the regime managed to spin as a, a Muslim jihad kind of thing. But we all know that this was a spontaneous outpouring of uh, uh, protest, led by women. Yes, led by women, led by students who had nothing to do with politics. So, and also, um, India is not Hungary. Um, it might be difficult to... Or Philippines? Or, I won't say Philippines, but yeah, maybe Philippines too. India or is Turkey? culturally very diverse. Turkey, so, Brazil? And it is very difficult for, it will be very difficult for any regime which uh, including aims, the people's republic of china where you've lived and worked yes so so india is very different in that sense india's diversity okay. makes democracy it's almost its default setting okay so uh, you you cannot but not have democracy in india okay thank you so much i'm i'm uh, i have run out of time it's difficult to summarize the contents of a book that runs into more than 300 pages over which, uh, on which you worked with your colleague for several years in a short interview. But thank you very much. Thank you. On Parker. behalf of the viewers of NewsClick, I thank you for coming here and giving thank us you. your views. And, and ladies and gentlemen, this is his book. This is Debashi Shuroi Choudhury's book, To Kill a Democracy 
India's Passage to Despotism. Debashish has written this book with John Keane. And do pick it up. I'm plugging his book. <laughs> Unabashedly, it's available by Pan Macmillan. And you can find out for yourself why or guess why Oxford University Press backed out of publishing the India edition. Stay with NewsClick. Keep watching this channel. Subscribe to this channel. Press that button. Donate generously to free and independent journalism. We are not the Godi media. Thank you very much for being with us.